Welcome to the first event of the series of online seminars hosted by the East-West Psychological Science Research Center at the Faculty of Psychology, Jalalongong University. And we tend to call the center in short, East-West Center. And my name is Jennifer Shawanowanid. I'm a lecturer here at the Faculty of Psychology and also the director of the East-West Research Center. So on behalf of our team, I would like to say that we are delighted to launch this series of online seminars. Um, we hope that this will be opportunities for us who are interested in culture and psychology to come together and actually share our academic perspectives and to disseminate our research findings. And at the same time, due to COVID-19, um, I think many of the conferences have been canceled in the past year. Um, so we really hope that this will be a platform for us to share what we do. And hopefully it could lead to um, potential collaborations um, in the future. And I see that many of you here are actually um, in different parts of the world. So we are very thrilled that this is happening. Um, before I turn over to two of our guest speakers today, um, I would like to spend a little bit of time introducing about the East-West Center. Um, the East-West Center is actually a part of the faculty and um, it was established at the same time at the Faculty of Psychology, which was about 50 years ago. Um, so at that time, um, it was established as a response to, um, to try to study a, a, a distinction between the Eastern perspective and the Western perspective of psychology. Um, but, but however, as you know that there are significant differences within the East and there are also significant differences within the West. Um, Thai culture is different from Japanese culture and Chinese culture and at the same time, Ecuadorian um, culture is quite different from American culture. Um, so the aim of the, the center now um, focus on a more broader range of topics, um, including cross-cultural psychology, intercultural relations, and also Eastern perspectives of psychology. And um, today's topic, um, which is called psychology in Ecuador, um, I think it is a great start for us to look at the non-weird populations in psychology. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the term weird, it, it stands for Western, um, educated, um, I stands for industrialized, rich and democratic populations. So I think this is a great start um, for, for the series of all I seminars. Um, so I would like to introduce you to the two excellent speakers that we have today. Um, first, we have Dr. Graham Pluck. Um, he has actually joined us at the Faculty of Psychology for two weeks now. Um, he's very new to the faculty, so we are very excited. Um, he got his degrees in Latin American studies and also psychology in the UK. And he also did his PhD in neuropsychology. And um, he was a professor in psychology at the San Francisco of Quito University in Ecuador for eight years. Um, during that time, he directed a research institute at the university and also conducted um, studies on cognitive ability of um, street children and homeless adults in Ecuador. So he would talk about psycho um, psychology research issues in Ecuador. And um, the second speaker that we have is Dr. Anna Treba. Um, she is an expert in um, McLean Hospital, Howard Medical School. Um, she, has, um, she has her degrees in neuroscience and also in clinical psychology. And she has been trained as a clinical psychologist specializing in CBT and also in mindfulness um, at Howard Medical School. And I think between 2014 and 2019, um, yeah, she, um, she taught psychology courses at San Francisco of Quito University. And at that time, she also provided care to patients in anxiety, um, personality disorders, and also depression. So today she would talk about clinical psychology related issues in Ecuador. And um, for each of the speakers, we'll have um, about 20 minutes. 
if you need more time, <laughs> feel free to do so. And at the end of the session, we also have Q&A for about 10 to 15 minutes. So um, for the audience, if you guys have any questions, you can type in the chat um, so I can gather all the questions and send it to the speakers at the end of the session. Okay, so I will hand um, over to Dr. Graham first. Okay, is the share working okay? Okay, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay, yes, yeah, so thank you for, uh, for the introduction. I'll speak first. Um, and I'm a, a research psychologist, really. Uh, and I was at, in Ecuador for almost eight years. And uh, in, at the end, I was directing this Institute of Neurosciences, uh, and we did a lot of, sort of neuropsychology research. But the stuff I want to talk about today is more to do with cognition, uh, and in particular in relation to sort of the socioeconomic status in Ecuador. Um, and I'm going to give you a sort of personal view based on the research that I did, uh, but I'm going to use it to highlight some of the, the cultural features within Ecuador. Uh, and just give you an idea about the country, because most of you uh, have probably never been to Ecuador. Uh, and hopefully you can learn a little bit about the, the culture there. Okay. So uh, first of all, I'll just give you an introduction to Ecuador. Uh, it's a smallish country in South America. Um, it's less than half the size of Thailand. Uh, so it's, you know, it's kind of a small country, but it feels like a large country. Uh, Spanish is the most common language spoken, uh, and it lies right on the equator. Okay, uh, in Spanish, uh, Ecuador means equator. So it's called the equator country. Okay. It's a very diverse uh, geographical country uh, because it has a large area of Pacific coast. Uh, it also has the Andes Mountains running right through it, uh, which means uh, the capital city is at a very high altitude. Uh, we lived at about 10,000 feet above sea level in Quito. Uh, there's also the Amazon rainforest is partly in Ecuador. Uh, and on top of that, uh, there's also the Galapagos Islands, which are in the Pacific Ocean, uh, part of Ecuador. So uh, the cultures are very varied because they see so many different uh, geographical regions. Now, I'm glad that Jennifer mentioned weird, because uh, I'm going to come back to this uh, and use this in some examples. But Ecuador is not a weird country. Uh, it's not a Western educated, just like rich and democratic country. It's some of those things, but it's not one of the, the main countries where lots of research comes from. Uh, in fact, there's very little research, uh, very little psychological research originates in Latin American countries. Uh, now, what I want to talk about is things like social status and literacy. Because for me, there was no point in doing, sort of trying to do standard psychological research, doing experimental psychology and things like this. It makes more sense uh, to try and adapt the research to the environment I'm in and the needs of the environment. Um, and for a non-weird country, this means for me is uh, things like social work status are important. Uh, and also, I'm going to talk a little bit about the local needs uh, for research and, and applied psychology uh, to do with sort of scales and normative data. Okay. So, um, now, the socioeconomics are of interest because Ecuador is a very financially sort of divided country. In Quito, for example, uh, there are many houses like this, uh, three quarter of a million dollar house in Quito, a very large house, very luxurious. 
And, but the majority of people in Quito live in houses more like this, okay? densely packed, fair, poorly constructed, uh, with limited amenities and limited sort of road access. So there's a big, big difference uh, between rich and poor. Well, a very big gradient of socioeconomic status in a country. Now, uh, as an example, this is some research we did on adolescents living in Quito. We were trying to correlate socioeconomic status with cognitive ability. And I just picked out uh, you know, a low SES participant from the database, a 13-year-old male. Uh, his mother had no education at all, his father uh, only had primary school education. Uh, they didn't own a home, they had no internet, uh, satellite TV, uh, but no telephone, uh, no mobile phone contract, of course, no domestic servants, uh, and no electronic devices to study with, such as a computer or even calculators. Uh, a high SES participant had all of these things, and very, uh, very well educated parents as well. So, this is the kind of difference between rich and poor, uh, which is which is bigger than in the weird countries generally, uh, which is likely to have an effect on cognitive function. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm not going to go into the date, details of the research. Uh, I just wanted to make the point that this is this is something which can be done in non-weird countries uh, and has an extra sort of value to come from those countries. In fact, we found the correlations between SES and cognition were much stronger than has been recorded in weird countries. Uh, a correlation of 0.7 between language ability and SS, SES. Uh, if anyone's done psychological research or reads journal articles, uh, you'll know that you know, correlation of 0.7 uh, is really high. Uh, you very rarely find such correlations so, you know, so such large magnitude. Uh, so it shows how important the social socio-economic socio socio-economic status uh, is to sort of psychological development in uh, the non-weird countries such as Ecuador. Now, another feature uh, of Latin American countries in general, uh, and also of many countries in Southeast Asia, uh, is what they call uh, the street children. Now, it's not a popular description, uh, but it's used to describe the phenomena of the being uh, children spending a long, a large amount of time in the urban environment, uh, unsupervised by adults. Um, and it's, in Latin American countries, they're usually working children. Uh, this, these are photos I took in Quito. Uh, this is a girl uh, who's working selling newspapers, I think she was. She walks around in the traffic selling, selling them through the windows. Uh, and this is a boy. Uh, working as a shoe shine. Shoe shine is common work uh, for boys uh, living in very poor families. Uh, again, this is Quito again. Uh, you can see the old Spanish colonial architecture in the center of Quito. And these two young boys working as shoe shines. Uh, this is another photo I took uh, in a bar in Quito. Uh, and again, a very young child, really. He's been walking around the bars, uh, trying to sell chewing gum to people. And this was about midnight. So these working children uh, are putting themselves, or well, they are in a sort of very vulnerable situation. They're very vulnerable to exploitation, uh, exposure to trauma, uh, and to abuse. Uh, now, we wanted to see uh, how, how this might be related to their cognitive development. Uh, and we recruited a group of these street children in Quinto. And this is my research assistant, Daniel. And he's using this test called uh, the Tower Test. Uh, and it's a test of reasoning and uh, sort of executive function. It's very difficult. You have to move the disks around and try and uh, recreate the pattern. Okay. So we use that. And we also assess the children for post traumatic stress disorder, uh, and then what we found, and the street children generally had low performance on cognitive tests, actually very low. 
And they also had very high levels of post-traumatic stress disorder. And, and in particular, the PTSD was higher uh, than you would find in, in even you know, quite trauma-exposed samples in weird countries. In the United States, in very, uh, very difficult neighborhoods with drug problems and gang problems, even there, the rate of PTSD is maybe up to 30% among adolescents. We found 65% in street children. And I think this is important because this is a, a not weird issue. You cannot do this kind of research uh, in countries like the United States where they don't have this phenomenon of street children. It's the type of research which you know, has to be done in countries such as Ecuador. Um, now, there's some challenges to this. Uh, I think all of you probably understand the importance of doing research in not weird countries. Uh, but you know, some people did not. Uh, and this reviewer, when we submitted the manuscript, the reviewer said, why is there a criticism that most research comes from high income countries? What would be the point? And the journal reviewer uh, doesn't understand about the problem of weird and non-weird uh, research. I mean, the issue is that you know, the majority, majority population do not live in weird countries. And, you know, and this is one of the problems you have trying to do psychological research in countries such as Ecuador. It becomes difficult to publish because of this sort of attitude. Uh, now, the other research uh, priority we had um, was looking at the validity and reliability of assessments uh, because it's difficult to do research because, again, the journals will always say, well, your scales are not valid and they're not reliable for use in Latin American countries, and which makes it harder to actually achieve any published research uh, when you're working in places like Ecuador. And we also wanted to look at normative data, and we also wanted to train researchers to try and improve the situation. Uh, now, one way we did this is whenever we published journal articles, um, we would include reliability data, and if possible, even uh, validity data on the different scales that we used. Uh, to the extent we even did things like do test, retest, reliability of questionnaires, and then include that in the articles where we published them. Uh, this allowed us to publish the research without getting the criticism uh, by the journals. Um, also, this means that if anybody wants to use these scales in future in other Latin American countries, uh, they can sort of look at this and show which scales are reliable and which are not. Um, another feature, uh, the other thing that we did was to try and actually uh, do formal testing reliability and validity and publish that in itself. Um, and one of the things we did was we created a, a brief sort of intelligence test uh, designed specially for countries such as Ecuador, uh, which is resource limited. So the test can be downloaded uh, and it be used in any country uh, and it's free of use. Okay. Um, and we did things like test the towers test to see whether it really works, and whether it's a reliable test for use in countries such as Ecuador. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to skip forward a little bit. Um, another feature we wanted to try and do is provide normative data. Now, it's a problem for clinical psychologists and educational psychologists in countries like Ecuador, because there is no normative data available. So it's impossible to just administer a test and then say whether that score is abnormally high or abnormally low, or whether it's average. Uh, and it's a very challenging thing to do in a country such as Ecuador. It's very diverse. Okay? I said before, there are coastal, Andean, Amazon, and Galapagos regions. Uh, there's also 13 different native languages, uh, plus the dominant language, Spanish, spoken. Uh, and there are many different sort of ethnic groups. Uh, majority of called uh, Mestizo, uh, and these are a mixed heritage of European and indigenous American. There are also Afro-Ecuadorians, uh, because uh, of course there are indigenous Americans as well, uh, and another group called Mantubio. 
Uh, so it becomes very challenging to even attempt to provide normative data in such a country. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, we were foolish enough to try. Uh, we tried to get normative data for the Weschel Adult Intelligence Scale. And we managed to get about 180 Spanish-speaking participants. Uh, but we could only really sample, even with our best efforts, from four different cities, two in the, in the mountain region and two cities on the coast. Um, and we were trying to do all of this on a $3,000 grant, uh, which is the other issue. In countries such as Ecuador, there's very limited funds available for research. Uh, so this is one of the challenges that you have to try and get work done uh, with, with really without uh, much funding available at all. Now, the final point, uh, training researchers. Uh, even the professors at universities often have you know, very limited training in research. Uh, so we tried to bring in researchers from other universities and try to offer training and show them how to collect data, how to write manuscripts. Um, particularly, we, we did this with Rio Bamba, uh, another city in the, in the Andes, and in Guayaquil, which is the biggest city uh, which is on the coast. Uh, but we also, but mainly, we worked uh, with research assistants. Uh, because we have no large research grants in this environment, almost all the research we did was conducted with volunteers. Um, now, all received research experience, and many were included as authors on articles, and many went on to postgraduate study. Now, these are all interrelated issues. The lack of funds really sort of allowed us uh, to achieve more in sort of education uh, because we had to work in this model of doing everything with volunteers. Uh, so instead of just hiring a postdoc to collect data, we had to bring in volunteers uh, and train them ourselves. Uh, so actually the educational and the, the limited funds worked, worked together. Okay, now, Gracias por su atención, which is Spanish for thank you for your attention. Uh, there's different ways you can contact me if you wish, if anyone has any questions after the meeting. But I'm going to finish now, and Anna Trueba, uh, who worked with me closely on research, uh, she's going to talk about some of the clinical aspects in Ecuador. Uh, and then afterwards, we will have some, some question and answer sessions with all of us. Okay, so Anna, do you want to take over? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, let me share my screen now. Sorry. Um, can everybody see my screen? Any problems with that? All right. So, um, Thank you for those introductions and thank you, Graham. I think that you showed really well what doing psychological research in uh, a non-weird country is like. Um, so today I'll be talking a little bit more about the clinical aspects. So how to, what is it like to be a practicing clinical psychologist and some of the things that um, that we worked on in terms of more like clinical training in, in Ecuador. Um, so I, I'm born and raised in Ecuador, um, but I came from a background where I was, you know, I, I was able to go to a, a school that's bilingual, learn English, um, be able to go study abroad in the U.S. So I did all my undergraduate and graduate studies in the United States. So I kind of have um, the view of, of, of both worlds, right? Uh, unlike Graham, I'm not, I, I'm born and raised in Ecuador, so, you know, I think I have a lot of insights into what um, it's like to be in Ecuador, but um, I fortunately had the opportunity to study abroad as well. Um, so that uh, really helped in my training and also I think helped when I went back to Ecuador to teach um, for the same time, uh, the same window that uh, Graham was also there. That's how we met. Um, 
to kind of give back and uh, really try to uh, develop some programs uh, to train students uh, in clinical work. Um, so I got my PhD, um, as I was describing, from Southern Methodist University, and then I, I did my internship uh, at McLean here in Boston, and now I'm currently working at McLean. Um, but then I taught from 2014 until 2019 at Universidad de San Francisco de Quito. Uh, Graham, you did a really good job of describing what Ecuador is like. Um, this is a university um, that is for, I would say it, 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 it gives a lot of scholarships, but on average, it would be for affluent students. Um, and so we have a lot of uh, foreign um professors like Graham that, that teach um, at a very high level. Um, and we have a, a big uh, percentage of PhD um, professors, which is not something that happens at all universities. In Ecuador, there's um, a scarcity of people that have um, a PhD level of training in psychology. Um, and at a university like Universidad San Francisco, we're fortunate enough where we do have uh, a bigger portion of our professors are uh, have a PhD. So the, one of the first things that um, I discovered when we got to Ecuador, and, and Graham, I think you saw the same thing, is that a lot of um, the psychologists that were practicing as clinicians in Ecuador uh, did not have a postgraduate degree. So in Ecuador, unlike in many weird countries, you can graduate with an undergraduate degree and practice psychology. Um, so part of it is because since it's not a liberal arts education, you sort of uh, go in right from your first year, um, you get intensely into psychology and you train in that for five years. To become a clinical psychologist, instead of it being a four-year degree, it's a five-year degree. Um, and then you can graduate and practice as a psychologist. Now, at Universidad San Francisco de Quito, since it was a university that was um, modeled um, from the U.S. and other European countries, it is a liberal arts education. Um, so students did have to take courses of common curriculum on top of, you know, their psychology major. So really, it wasn't enough training to really say, you know, you're eligible to treat patients right off, you know, undergraduate studies because, there's not enough years of training, you know, in terms of um, really that training that you only get from practicing and really having patients in front of you and, and getting supervision. Um, so I really found it very problematic that people were graduating from their undergraduate degree and just going directly into uh, clinical practice because you really don't see this in other areas of the world and other um, in, in weird countries. And and, and there's a reason, right? So I think that just ethically and in terms of how much training you have right off the bat when you graduate um, from your undergraduate degree is just not enough. And so with other professors, we formed a master's program at Universidad San Francisco de Quito. It was one of the first master's program in clinical psychology in the country. Um, because this is the other piece is that the reason why a lot of people in, in Ecuador do not have a master's degree or a PhD in clinical psychology is that these programs do not exist. So I, again, like I know that I just said, you know, it's, I don't think it's really ethical for people to be practicing right after your undergraduate degree. But at the same time, we wouldn't have any clinical psychologists because we don't really have programs to train people at a master's or PhD level. So it, it is a conundrum because what you would essentially be is forcing people to go abroad and not everybody has the resources to go abroad uh, and study to get their master's or PhD. So I, we felt like this was a huge step um, into giving additional training to people so that they could practice in a more ethical way and, and provide better services, um, but also being for, you know, giving them like a real opportunity because it's not feasible for everybody to just study abroad. Um, so this was a program that we developed that was a scientist practitioner model. Um, it was modeled to be just as strong in terms of clinical work as well as research. Um, so this is a typical program in the U.S. would have this sort of model. Um, and the idea was that we would train people also to understand the research aspect, to understand what clinical trials are like, so that when they're practicing clinically, 
Um, they also understand the importance of empirically supported treatments uh, and clinical work, because this is the other piece that I would see a lot in Ecuador is that a lot of people are practicing, but they're practicing old psychology, like very Freudian or young um, approaches to psychology. And not that that is inherently bad. The problem is that there wasn't a lot of evidence-based treatments being disseminated in Ecuador. And I did find that a little problematic. Like I had a couple of OCD patients that were, I think, um, very, um, what could I, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? Like, um, I guess they were in a very disadvantaged situation because they were receiving uh, psychotherapy that was not evidence-based. And, uh, and I do think it, it, it um, created harm for these patients and made their OCD worse. So, I think that this was a key piece for me was to start disseminating more evidence-based practices that were not just young or Freud, which, you know, again, some people mix this into psychotherapy, but I do think that cognitive behavioral approaches are very important to, to start disseminating uh, in a country like Ecuador, where um, psychology really had stayed stagnant for, you know, the better part of more than 50 years uh, since Freud developed this theories. So we felt like this was a really good step uh, into giving uh, people that sort of training. But it was a struggle because even having people understand the importance of evidence-based uh, treatments was hard. A lot of people get into this sort of attitude of, well, my preference is Freud or Jung. Like that's, you know, I like their theories more. And having them understand that when you're a practitioner, when you're clinic, when you work clinically, you can't really base your clinical practice or your approach on what you prefer, what your preference is, but rather what's the research saying is best for your patient. Um, so having people understand that, that you, you can't just say, you know, this is my preference or this is my favorite sort of theory and this is what I'm passionate about uh, is not as important as what would better serve the patient? What does the evidence say that works best for an OCD patient or a, or a patient that's undergoing depression? Um, so that was sort of a challenge. And I think a lot of people felt that I was minimizing or um, sort of, um, yeah, minimizing the work of other psychologists. Um, but I was trying to make them understand that, you know, it, it doesn't come to, yeah, it's not me trying to impose a new uh, view. It's more what's best for the patients um, in the long term. So that was a little hard, but I think that, you know, giving several courses and, and Graham also helped me a lot here um, through his courses, really trying to get people to understand that, you know, when we're saying this treatment is better, it's not because it's dogmatic, of, you know, or I'm trying to impose another view. It's really what what the research is saying is best. It's not anybody's preference or me trying to impose, you know, a, a weird standard uh, on our country or something like that. It's more, this is what the research said. The other thing that um, I started doing at the clinic at Universidad San Francisco de Quito is offering DBT and ACT groups, uh, as well as individual therapy. Um, a lot of these protocols were inspired uh, from my work at McLean. Um, we adapted them to Spanish and Ecuadorian culture. Um, so this was really helpful. And, and for those of you that are not familiar, DBT stands for Dialectical Behavioral Therapy and ACT stands for Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. So these are both um, third wave CBT uh, sort of treatments. Because this is the other piece. I saw a lot of borderline personality disorder in Ecuador. That was one of the, one of the main patient populations that I would treat. Um, and there were not a lot of DBT therapists. There was a lot of misdiagnosis with bipolar disorder, which to be fair, is very hard, that differential diagnosis. Um, so that was something that I worked on a lot uh, while I was in Ecuador. And then in 2017, we had a big um, earthquake hit in Pedernales, which is in the coastal area of Ecuador. It was a 7.8 um, on the Richter scale. It was it really decimated that whole area, um, these two these cities in general. Um, and what I did with uh, another colleague was offer um, free workshops on PTSD um, treatment, specifically uh, exposure and response prevention or PTSD. Um, because again, this is what, you know, most, 
more evidence-based approach uh, to PTSD. So these are the sorts of workshops that I would offer. Um, I offered uh, DBT workshops as well. Um, and usually they were open to the community. And, and really the idea was, again, to disseminate evidence-based practices uh, to a wider audience. And the people that attended these were clinicians. So this wasn't really open for patients. Um, it was more for clinicians to learn different treatment modalities so that they can then go to their own practices and sort of start practicing this on, on their patients. Um, I also went to the coast um, and uh, disseminated some more there with local psychologists and also directly seeing patients um, in the coastal area um, where people were, um, you know, impacted by the earthquake. Um, I also worked in Neuroquito. Um, this is my private practice. So I saw a lot of patients here. I had a sliding scale. So what I did, for those of you that are not familiar with what a sliding scale is, is that um, patients that had more money, uh, I would charge a certain price. And then people that didn't have the resources or the income to, to see me uh, or to, to pay that you know elevated price point, uh, I would give them a discount rate. Um, depending on what their means were, so that, you know, um, more people got uh, treatment. Um, and I treated pe uh, patients that had anxiety, depression, borderline personality disorder, and some geriatric patients um, because I worked with a neurologist and he just, you know, referred me a lot of these patients. And so one of the things that I observed in our culture, which is a little different from uh, what I observe here in the U.S., and, in, and I'm sure it's similar in other weird uh, countries, is that... Um, patients in Latin America have a lot more stigma towards mental health issues. Um, and what this leads to is a lot more somatization. So patients would present with pains and aches. Um, but really what was underlying all that is either depression, anxiety, a personality disorder. It just, it seemed to me, and this is um, a conjecture I'm making, is that for a lot of people, it was safer to say, you know, what I'm having is like IBS or like a, a stomach issue or my problem is medical because there's less stigma around that. Um, so it was almost like they were, and it wasn't that they were making it up. I think they, it was a true somatization presentation of their illness, but I think it's in part also our culture um, that makes it so, yeah, like for example, this neurologist, Nelson Maldonado, who is this tall man here. He referred me a lot of his patients because a lot of them present or go to medical doctors like a neurologist, not even a psychiatrist, but a neurologist, because it seems less stigmatizing to do that. So before even thinking that they have a psychological condition, they'd rather go to a medical doctor, um, you know, and think, you know, there's something you know wrong with my brain or, you know, I have like um, these weird sensations in my legs and maybe it's neurological rather than thinking it might be a psychological issue. So there was a lot that I had to do around psychoeducation so that people understood, you know, that um, that having a psychological diagnosis is just like having a medical diagnosis. It, it, they're equally valid uh, and there shouldn't be so much stigma, but of course there is around mental illness, um, that the brain is just another organ and um, that there shouldn't be um, this much hesitation towards seeking uh, treatment. Because again, it, it, it's not less valid than having a medical condition. It's not something you control. No one decides to wake up and be depressed. Um, it's not something you control. It's something that just sort of happens. Um, sometimes it's a it, it's different things that trigger it in your life um, that all come into like this perfect storm. So yeah, so there was a lot of that um, sort of dialogue with my patients um, and, and sort of reacquainting them with what psychotherapy is like and um, and helping them through that sort of stigma that surrounds mental health. And I think a lot of the workshops that we did and a lot of the talks that we had also helped in terms of, you know, the more you talk about mental illness, the more it reduces the stigma. And then with my adolescence patients, you know, I had to work a lot with parents that had a lot of issues around, again, stigma around mental health, very invalidating towards their children. So they had, for example, I had parents that had patients, you know, their, 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 their sons or daughters had depression and they would say, you know, you're being lazy. That's the problem. You're not, you know, you're not focusing on your schoolwork. What you need is more discipline and more structure. Um, 
And so really educating them on like, this isn't laziness. This isn't that your child, you know, doesn't want to work or is being um, a, a brat. It's really they're, they're struggling with severe mental illness. So those sort of things were really um, key, I think, to to helping patients, families, uh, and the broader community to to better manage mental health uh, because there's a lot more stigma than there is in weird countries. In weird countries, there's already tremendous amount of stigma ar- around mental health issues, but there's a lot more in in countries like uh, Ecuador. I think it's a lack of education. Um, a lot of our treatments are backwards, so you know the worldview on mental health is very uh, sadly very stigmatized. Um, and then the other piece that I'm still developing is online courses in Spanish. Um, I do find that there is very few resources, and that's another barrier. Um, just like Graham spoke about um, in terms of research, in clinical work, there's also a tremendous barrier in terms of language. So there's a there's not as many materials in Spanish um, for clinical work, for DBT skills, for CBT skills, as there is in English. Um, a lot of the books are in English. So when I try to, you know, give parents books so that they get better acquainted on what borderline personality disorder is and, you know, skills work, a lot of it's written in English. And this is a huge barrier for people that don't speak the language. Um, so that is something that I think uh, is a future direction uh, to disseminating more uh, evidence-based practices is really translating a lot of these materials and doing more uh, in Spanish. Think that that's a big piece and with this i also you know develop my own social media platforms to sort of disseminate more things uh in spanish you know more uh, of these ideas of, of small little things on psychology so that people get a better understanding of um, mental health issues you know what's a pro- what's with what are some good resources uh, that can help with these issues, what sort of clinicians or psychologists should be seeking if they have depression, anxiety, OCD, et cetera. And that is it. So I guess we can open it now to questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Anna, and also Dr. Graham. Does anyone would like to ask questions? Um, Okay, um, I do get a question. Um, so I'll just read it out for you guys. Um, have the university and the government been giving this issue more attention since the initiatives by the professors to develop the field, both in research and in practice? Anna probably knows this better. She probably knows policy in Ecuador better than me. So, you know, one of the things, and I think that this is something that I will go back at some point to Ecuador to do, is that um, I would like to work with the government in creating some sort of licensing board so that there's a little bit more oversight on clinicians that are practicing. So even if they only have a undergraduate degree, um, because again, since there's only a few master's program in Ecuador, we can't really expect all of the graduating clinical psychologists to go to those two master programs, I think, um, that are available and, and become practicing clinicians. So coming up with some sort of licensing board, that, that this is something that we see in weird countries, right? Like in the US, you have a licensing board in the UK, et cetera, in Canada. So coming up with a structure like that would be amazing. But up till now, um, the government hasn't been very open to um, sort of restructuring some of these um these areas, uh, these gray areas where people are just practicing um, without any oversight. So I think that that is something that I would like to work on. Um, And in terms of the university, the university did open up. So they were the ones that said, okay, I, you know, with a couple of professors, we were like, we want to form a master's program. And they were like, yes, let's do this. Let's form the master's program. They were also open to hiring um, new professors. Now, where we sort of get into an impasse with the university is that there were professors that were doing things that were not that ethical. And it was hard for the university to really understand, you know, this is not ethical practice and maybe these professors should not be 
practicing here at the university or be teaching. That that piece was a little harder for them. Um, but new hires and such, to an extent, they were open to, to listening to our um, to to how we saw it. Like these these are new hires we should do so that we expand, you know, our program in a way that is evidence based and we're getting you know the sort of professionals that we need to train our students in that way, um, rather than professors that, you know, um, we're from non-evidence-based sort of lines of practice. There was a lot of that. So. Just a quick question to continue um, to your thought. Um, would you see like the same challenges within um, other subfields within psychology too? Like for example, like counseling psychology, um, do they face like the same challenges? And, and I think like in, in Ecuador, actually, um, there isn't really like a counseling degree um, or a social worker degree. It really is all like clinical psychology uh, together. So that's another thing that I think would be kind of neat if we could sort of develop these different branches, right? But that's more sophisticated. And, and in Ecuador, things are still very rudimentary in, that, in, in terms of that. Okay, I have a lot more questions, so I'm going to move on to the second one. Um, so the next question is that as an Ecuadorian physician, I have witnessed the stigma about mental health, as Dr. Anna said. So as healthcare providers, what can we do to eliminate this stigma? I mean, this is an excellent question. I think, you know, the more we talk about it, the better. Um, it's sort of like, you know, it should not be like, you know, from the Harry Potter series, like Voldemort, the one that we don't talk about. Because like the thing is, when we don't talk about it, there's more and more misunderstanding and misinformation out there because people just consume sort of media portrayals of mental illness, um, which are very skewed and biased. Um, and I think the idea we get is that it sort of becomes every family's dirty little secret. No one talks about it. Um and so no one gets really the support or validation. Whereas when we're talking about it more openly, people are like, oh, you know, this is more common than I thought. And it sort of normalizes that most of us at some point are going to struggle with mental health. It's just a fact. It's just like physical health. Like we all end up at the doctor at some point and, and, and mental health is the same. But if we're not talking about it openly with family members, et cetera, like we do, you know, when we have a physical condition, we're usually very open to talking with other people about it. When it comes to mental health, rightly so, we're, we're more hesitant. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that it's, um, there's a lot more stigma, right? So I think that um, learning to talk about it more just allows other people to be like, oh yeah, I also um, suffer from that. And it, it creates spaces for um, validation, support, et cetera. So I think that, yeah, the more we talk about it, the better. So I'm not a, I'm not really a clinic, clinician myself, but uh, just to add to that, I think social media is a, a, a good way uh, which it does address this issue. Uh, people are often more open on social media and are more likely to, to say that they're having issues. Uh, and also uh, the people like Anna, has been very good in, in using social media uh, to you know to make uh, send messages about mental illness and about psychology. Uh, and Anna, how many followers how followers do you have now? I have like uh, more than twenty two thousand on Instagram. <laughs> yeah, uh, close to fifty thousand on TikTok. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she does a lot of stuff on mental illness, uh, and I think that kind of approach is actually very effective in countries like Ecuador. Yeah, I agree. I, I found it was. Yeah. Yeah. I think social media is a great way of getting to people um, because it's, you know, people don't want to read long text. The only problem with it, of course, is that you can't get into any nuanced issue. So you, you tend to overgeneralize <laughs> to a crazy extent. Um, certainly very different from academic writing. Right. Um, but I think that the idea you, you sort of try to balance trying to get as to as many people as possible, um, even if this means that you're a little less accurate and precise because you have to be short and, you know, to the point. So, but yeah, I think I agree with, with Grant. I think people are a lot more open and it sort of that issue out there. So 
you know, what I've seen in my social media accounts is people didn't even are struggling sort of silently with their mental illness. But when they see a social media post that sort of resonates with them, they sort of consider, you know what, maybe I should seek help because it seems like I do have an issue here. And like this resonates with me. And instead of suffering silently, they might ask me, do you think I should see a professional? This is what I'm. And of course, I don't really offer much psychological advice through social media. These are not my patients or anything like that, but it can sort of help them guide, guide them to the right channel so that they get, you know, a professional evaluation and help. Okay. And do you think like cultural faiths or beliefs contribute to, to like this stigma too? Because I see like some similarities between like Ecuador and Thailand. So. Yeah, definitely. I think um, culturally we put like the medical stuff as, you know, the first thing and then all the other stuff is sort of, um, you made it up, it's in your mind. And then if we mix that with machismo, like the chauvinism that we have in, in Latin America, there's also this sort of stereotype of the hysterical woman, you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, like what you see in soap operas. And so there's tremendous amount of invalidation towards women like, you know, you know, and you see this also in weird countries where it's like, are you on your period? But it's more extreme in Ecuador, I would say. Um, whereas this like, uh, you know, this is how women are, like they're so hormonal or whatever. Uh, and so there's a lot of that mix as well. Um, and it, it's, it's a bad, it's a bad combination that creates a lot of stigma, a lot of invalidation, um, you know, being sort of and this is the thing, and, and this is what I tell a lot of people in Latin America, it's better to have a diagnosis sometimes. I know people think that this is going to create more stigma and is going to sort of pigeonhole you. But actually, when you are you don't receive a diagnosis culturally, in Ecuador at least, you get labeled other things like, you know, you're, you're hormonal or whatever. Whereas when you have a diagnosis like BPD, people understand, oh, this is a condition. It's not just you being... Um, a crazy hormonal woman or whatever. Um, so I think that this is, this is important, but there's a long road to go. There's a lot of cultural things with chauvinism. Um, just, yeah. Our patriarchal society is very, is, is, is more extreme, I would say, than it is in other weird countries. So there's a lot of that as well. Okay, um, we have a few more questions. Um, this one we have, when you said the protocol in therapy is adopted to Spanish and Ecuadorian, could you explain a little bit more about that? Yeah, of course. So when so when we adapted it to, to the Spanish language, um, there are certain terms that don't translate as well. Um, and so some of it was trying to figure out like what's culturally... Um, like the most appropriate way of, of sort of translating that. And then there's also, you know, when you're going through these different therapy modalities in DBT, there might be examples and things that I might change so that they're more culturally kind of aligned with, with Ecuador. So, um, you know, like for example, even like, so it, there's certain treatment modal. So in DBT, there's certain parts like in distress tolerance where we talk about like, maladaptive coping there's certain like you know substance abuse issues here in the u.s that are not as common in ecuador like for example here we talk a lot about opioid abuse that is not such a common problem in ecuador there are other maladaptive coping going on in ecuador that you know are more common just culturally than in the u.s and so little changes like that um where i won't i won't be talking extensively about opioid abuse in, in a country like ecuador where it, it's not as common place yeah there's more of an alcohol issue and, you know, more cigarettes and, and other uh, sorts of issues. Okay. And I think this is um, a relevant question. How does COVID-19 affect the mental health of the people in Ecuador? Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> Um, I'm not sure if you were in Ecuador during the time when the COVID-19 hit, but maybe you could share something. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I think I can just because I, all my family's there. And um, I also did several se workshops and seminars over the course of COVID. Um, I think it's impacted tremendously mental health um, for various reasons. And so the quarantine was, I think, more extreme than it was in weird countries in, in a lot of ways, especially the U.S. I can't speak to all countries, right? But 
Um, and, and in part is because in countries like Ecuador, we sort of depend on social distancing because we won't, we don't have the technology or the medical uh, capacity um, to, to treat patients like, like you do in developed countries, right? Um, and so I think the, the quarantine fatigue is more extreme. Like, for example, schools have been closed a lot longer than they have here in the U.S. And so for parents that are trying to work at home, raise their children, and keep, you know, their sanity, I think in Ecuador, it's been a lot more extreme in, in that respect. And then there's a lot more anxiety, like right now around the vaccine, for example, there aren't vaccines in Ecuador, like the healthcare workers have gotten their vaccine, um, but no one else. And so people are scrambling to see if they go to another country to get the vaccine. And, you know, there's a lot of anxiety around that. And then, of course, you know, people that land in the hospital, um, there's a lot of concerns about not having enough respirators uh, or, you know, the medical staff. There was a tremendous amount of death in Guayaquil, uh, the coastal city. Um, they've done some reports finding that, you know, it's one of the hardest hit cities, I think, in the world. And so there's a lot of just, you know, the grieving process of just a lot of death, I think, uh, in general in our countries, um, which is very unfortunate. So I think that those are some of the unique struggles on top of, you know, quarantine fatigue, the fact that we're socially distancing, we've lost structure, all that, that already contributes to depression and anxiety. But that's in all of the world, I think. Okay, um, I have a question for Dr. Graham. What advice would you give to students who want to get involved in psychology research? Um, I w well, I would say try and try and find someone who's doing research and volunteer. And the easiest way and the best the best way to learn about research is just you know being part of the research, and it's also a really good way just to learn more about psychology. If you do research, you, you learn in a very deep way. And, and if possible, you know, the easiest way to, to achieve that uh, is to find an active researcher and contact them and say, do you need a research assistant? And, and if you're available, if you have time uh, to donate, uh, they, they may well you know, have um, some, something you can do for them. Uh, and you can learn valuable skills in that way. I did that when I was an undergraduate student. I helped out in a neuropsychology lab. Um, and when we were in Ecuador, we did this all the time. I had maybe sometimes six or seven assistants working for me. And maybe they were only sort of given three hours a week sometimes. Uh, but they were all contributing to the research. Uh, and some of them, you know, they developed a greater interest in psychology and in research. And many of them went on postgraduate study and uh, some of them are doing PhDs at the moment. So I think that would be my advice, just try and find people who are doing research and help them. Is that okay? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if Dr. Anna would like to add anything or? No, I think that that's perfect. I think that that, I think that's the best way to go. I'm really, <laughs> Yeah, I think you did the same, didn't you, Anna? Yes, yes, I did. Yeah. That's that's the way I did it. Um, yeah, and you know, and this is another piece. Like, it can be research. I mean, hopefully, it's research that you're interested in. But really, any research experience is good. Um, so, if because don't, I guess, don't um, hesitate to to latch onto any research opportunity that comes up. Like, if the ideal person that you wanted to work with, it you know, it didn't pan out any research opportunity is gonna further your CV um, and help so that you can further your career in clinical psychology. Like I did research in like various bacteria and like weekly electric fish. Well, I was studying neuroscience, right? And as an undergraduate before I went to do my graduate studies in clinical psychology. But what they wanna see is that you have done research and you know understand what it's like and understand uh, the scientific method, you understand what you know, what the scientific processes entails and like in terms of um, creating posters and, you know, what writing a paper is like, that's what they're most interested in. So it's better if it's aligned with what you want to do, of course, in the long term, but 
it's better to have some research experience than none at all. So. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone have more questions? Um, so in case someone would like to, to ask. I do. Sorry if, if I don't turn on the video, it's maybe not in a presentable um, more at the moment. So maybe sound only might be better. Um, but let me know if you can't um, hear me properly or, or um, accurately. Um, so when you describe, you know, like psychology in Ecuador, if I don't hear the name of the country, I thought that you were describing, you know, psychology in Thailand, <laughs> or the status of, you know, psychology or clinical psychology or mental health in Thailand. Um, so while I was listening to what you say, I was trying to think of, you know, like two countries who are quite, you know, far away. Um, and of course have different or unique um, culture in their own way. Um, but at the end, they sort of shared this you know, stigmatization on mental health or you know, when you talk about um, clinical psychologists like graduating from undergrad level because we don't have um, many uh, master degree or or higher, you know, like po or doctorate degree in, in clinical psychology here. Um, so it's kind of similar in some way as well, though we have, but very few. Um, or like, yeah, or, or, or like mental health in general. So then I was thinking of, you know, what make our countries share these similarities? Is it about, um, you know, SES, like socioeconomic status, because both are developed country, um, oh, well, developing or underdeveloped or backward in Thailand, maybe worse now, but, um, or is about, um, I'm not sure in Ecuador, but in here, you know, some people describe this as maybe is collectivistic culture that, you know, you need to save family's face. Um, uh, so not talk about mental health. Uh, or like education as well, like lack of education. So I think, yeah, I want to hear from your opinion of what do you think that makes both countries share these similarities? I mean, I think that you have some great insights there. I think there is extreme, um, so we're not, I think, well, I can't really speak because I'm not an anthropologist, but I think we are also collectivistics in some ways. Like we're, we're definitely less individualistic than the U.S., um, but probably a little bit more individualistic than, um, than, than other countries. So probably somewhere in the middle, but we do have this thing with the family and family reputation. Um, so there's a lot of this sort of, you know, if there's an alcoholic in a family, they're like, Ooh, that family, you know, um, you know, even when I met my husband, like my family who's educated, but they're still like, you know, who are their family members to sort of figure out if this person's good or not, which is, weird to me, but that, that's sort of how it works. And so there is this family reputation thing going on and um, an embarrassment over people that have or struggle with these things. And so I think there is a piece to that um, in, in the stigma, but there, there's also, yeah, the lack of education is a big piece. And I think there's also the socioeconomic situation um, that I think both countries share. Um, and that so the fact that we're like lower on the socioeconomic scale makes it so that there's less opportunities um, to further your education. You want to go directly into working so that you can make money. Right. Um, but then, yeah, there are also no infrastructure. Like there's the higher education, there isn't enough master's programs to really further your knowledge. So it's, it's a multi, I guess, pronged problem that we have in, in our countries. Um, I think we would have to start with creating new, more master's programs, right? And disseminating more information, I think is the only way to sort of uh, improve on this. Um, yeah. And at minimum, getting some sort of licensing board where we're at least testing people to see how they're practicing their psychology, um, for there to be some oversight. Because here people like, you know, have lawsuits against psychologists when they malpractice. In Ecuador, since there's no ethical board, there's no oversight, it's harder to keep people in check when they do unethical things like sleep with their patients or 
I there's so many horror stories in Ecuador. It's crazy. Like of what there's a lot of good practitioners, but since there's no oversight, there's also crazy abuse. So, but so I if I ask you further about that, do we have time? Because <laughs> um, if we talk about like um, licensing board, right? So we have licensing board for clinical psychology um, here in Thailand, but not oh, cool. like for counselors. And because I'm, I'm a counselor, I'm not a clinical psychologist. And I graduated from the UK um, where they don't have license, licensing board like for, for a counselor. They have for clinical psychologists, right? Um, and in Thailand right now, we are trying to have licensure for counselor as well. And part of me, if, if I'm in trouble saying this or not, hopefully not, but <laughs> um, so part of me because Thai culture we are like power can be easily abused, you know, like, and when, when, when we talk about power, it's not just about power of, of like um, being a clinical psychologist or being a counselor, you know, like over patients, but also power from people in a higher position as like in the board, right. That, that they can control or they can say that this is the only way, you know, you need to, to follow us, um, because in a way, this is how you know Thai culture is like we listen to the the people who are in power, whether or not they are right or wrong, we follow them, right? And and I see this as the risk that if we give a group of people have some some sort of power, um, and and that can be easily abused in the future as well, right? I'm considering the culture that is not quite democratic at the moment, right? Um, I agree. And we would probably yeah. face something similar in Ecuador. Um, power is easily corrupted. Like we've had heads of departments in, in Ecuador that have done some very questionable things. Um, and then no one can remove them from that position. And we're sort of like, they're setting like crazy ethical standards for the students and it's, it's really hard to navigate that. So I, I think, yeah, you're right. It is a double-edged sword because once you put people in, in that sort of position of power, it can also become a huge issue if they're not, you know, if they're abusing that. So I agree. So how, so what's you, what do you think about this then? That so I think what would have to happen is we would have to have like a board and it would have to be people that rotate. Because in Ecuador, what happens is once they take power, it's like forever. It's like a dictatorship. It's like, I'm here for 30 years. Like we had a head of department for 30 years and crazy stuff happened during the course of those 30 years, unchecked, unquestioned, you know? And so I do think that if you have a position that rotates, like that person has to be out in two years, that way you can keep it cleaner, you know? Um, and also having a board. So it's not just one person. Um, and that board would have to, you know, I would say follow what the evidence-based stuff is saying like you know not just you know their preference or you know their biases so something like that could be a solution but it's tough it's tough because sometimes you know people take power and then no one wants to people are like hey well you need to leave uh, that position and they won't so thank you <laughs> Problem. okay okay um i think we we run out of time, <laughs> even though like I, I get more questions. Um, so maybe next time we have to do like two hours. <laughs> but I think the time has come to an end. Um, thank you so much to Dr. Graham and Dr. Anna for sharing with us your experiences in Ecuador and how psychology is studied and practiced. Um, and also um, we, um, we learned about the challenges that um, psychologists face in, in Ecuador. And I see some similarities between Ecuador and Thailand, um, but yeah, we don't really have time to discuss. Um, this is a great start. And yeah, thank you so much um, to both of you. And also thank you to, um, to everyone who has joined us today. Uh, for those of you who are in Thailand, today is Songkhan Day, it's Thai New Year, so it's a holiday. So <laughs> thank you for being with us on the holiday. And for those of you who are outside Thailand, um, like I said, like I'm very excited and I think our team is very excited too to have people um, from outside Thailand to come to this seminars and share thoughts and ideas together.
Okay, so thank you so much for, to everyone who is here today. Thank you. Thank, thank you for having thank us. Thank you for coming, yeah. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. Bye. <laughs>